Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 620th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Stay tuned for the most amazing deal on bulk seeds and seed saving education you have ever seen. A few years ago, our team created an event called the Great American Seed Up, where we pack hundreds of people into a room over a few days to scoop amazing open pollinated and heirloom seeds for their gardens and collections. We came up with the scoop your own model because the majority of the cost of seeds is actually in the packaging and distribution. So by eliminating these costs, people can buy seeds at bulk pricing. Well, as you can imagine, packing hundreds of people into a room is not feasible these days, so we had to get creative. We came up with the seed up in a box. And what's amazing about it is that now you can get these bulk seeds wherever you are in the world. We've chosen seeds that are popular, non-GMO, open pollinated, and easy to grow. They're bundled 10 jumbo packs per variety, so you can share them with your community, family, church, or school. Your job is to split them into individual packages. Our job is to make them as inexpensive as possible, and right now, they're averaging about 60 cents per individual jumbo portion. With all the uncertainty in the world, a lot of people are thinking about how we can make our future more food secure. Seed Up in a Box is a great way to do this because each bundle has enough seeds and education so that you may never have to purchase seeds again. This is an amazing deal, and I am so excited for the opportunity to take the Great American Seed Up all around the world via our Seed Up in a Box. Learn more about Seed Up in a Box and get your own bundle by going to greatamericanseedup.org. That's greatamericanseedup.org. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from the Urban Farm in a very, very hot Phoenix, Arizona. And I am here with Janice Norton. Hello, everybody. I'm Janice Norton, and I'm coming in from Two Piece in a Pod. That's my name for my little urban farm. I'm in the northern, northwest area of Phoenix called Peoria. Nice. And we have Don Titmus. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I live east of the metro Phoenix area in a city called Mesa. So my rain harvesting and rain experience is slightly different from the other folks, but it's going to be compatible to wherever you are. Yeah. And what's the name of your farm? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I live at the B Oasis. There you go. Facebook me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. B Oasis on Facebook. I'm allergic to Facebook, so. All right. Yeah, I know. The topic for tonight, Miss Janice, is water in and for our landscapes. All right, so Don, yeah. let's get on the road you know, with this I conversation. I want to say something about. Go I want to say something about our topics. Oh, please um, jump in. Yes. When we were designing our program for the year, I'm a little OCD and I like to have things lined up, and so we have our seed chats, and now we're adding on there two new things: our monthly garden chats and our monthly tree care chats for our local folks. And I really wanted to come up with some topics that were gonna work for each month. So as I was sitting there in January or maybe even December, coming up with the list of what we were gonna do, I came up with the topic for this month being something related to water harvesting. I mean, it's June, it's Phoenix. What else are we gonna start talking about? Right. And little did I realize how many other things were gonna line up to make it such an important topic right now. Right. Yeah, exactly. It really is. Yeah, especially the heat. We wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have guessed this heat would have uh, come on. So, and, and the problem with the problem with the heat isn't just the heat; it's that it dries up, it desiccates, it dehydrates things, and we're seeing a lot of dead trees in you know in and around. You're, well, you work in the landscaping. Don, tell yep. us about that. Lots what of big seeing? trees going. We're losing a lot of the Aleppo pines that have been around for 50, 60 years. And they're just, uh, just dry, massive needles up in there and huge fire risk. And so uh, the, the tree people have been busy taking down dead pine trees. So it's, it's really tough. Yeah. And that's not limited to just Phoenix. That's spreading throughout the, the 
western half of the United States right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Literally yeah. half the of west, the United States. The west is on fire and the and the east is soaking wet. Right. Coastal's drowning. <laughs> yeah. Right. Go figure. All right. Well, so Don, let's start. You know, I always like to start with our favorite topic called permaculture. Talk to me about you know p- permaculture and how it relates to water harvesting. Maybe maybe define permaculture first. That's always a challenge because there are so many different definitions. Yeah, I know. I like yours, the art and science of of sustainable living or something close to that. I like you know something to do with um, it's being mimicking nature, following nature, mm-hmm. using nature as your guide and your teacher. And so when we do the first principle, which is observation in permaculture, we are then recording into our minds all that we are seeing and feeling and engage with, and then we can incorporate that and connect them. So it's the connections between the various scattered elements on a home site that permaculture designers do is they put them together, link them up, and so they stack together, they work together, they create more edge, and we'll talk about that in a little while. And uh, we use the microclimates, we use them to the best of our ability to enact the local climate with an understanding of what's going on all around us. So it's a very integrative, holistic way of living in harmony on the land. <laughs> oh, nice. I know that was long, right? <laughs> no, that was great. I don't know how to say. I don't know. I, I don't have a little sentence like you do. I just like oh, yeah, I gotta go. Uh, We're gonna get an elevator pitch sentence for you for permaculture. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can contain myself. Oh, there you go. There's one piece. <laughs> there's one piece that really stood out for me, and that's the observation part. You know, building an observation process for you on your property is one of the most important things that you can be doing. And I'm not talk, I'm not pointing at Don. I'm, I'm talking to all of us. And setting up that observation is key. And one of the things that I've done over the years is I've learned how to see water on a property, even if it hasn't rained in six months. Because of the way that water flows a, a, across a property, it leaves a memory it leaves clues, and I can walk on. I can walk onto any property here in the in the valley, and probably in the state of Arizona, in the desert, and I can tell you how much water they're getting, and where it's coming from, simply by the flow patterns that are on the property. Observation. Key, very, very, very key, to, especially with permaculture. Mollison always talked about if you want to live on the land then do so in the four seasons so you get to know you do the observation during the four seasons and get a better idea of what you're getting in self into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I've said that for years. Spend a year on your property right. before you make any major changes. There you I go. So. learned that the hard way. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we all have. <laughs> Guilty as uh, stated. Yes. So... The first thing I like to observe for is how many sources of water we have on our property. And I, I want you to maybe answer this, Janice. Count off the how many sources of water you have on your property. How many sources of water I have? Yeah. Where is your water rain. coming from? I've got rain when it and if it comes. I've got a couple of spigots. And so I've got water. water that comes with city water. And I've got water from the city that comes via my neighbors who might overwater. Oh. That's Ah, it. That's it. Nice. All right, I don't have any lakes or rivers or anything. I I do like OPW. I do like that. (laughs) Other people's water, right? What about me? What about me? Yes, 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 yes. So the the backup is the city water. That's what, you know, I have to use, especially in between the rains. Then I have a rain harvesting machine on the B Oasis. So mm-hmm. I, my goal is always to catch what lands on my property, stays on my property, and that's always been my goal. I've had to adjust over the years because the monsoon rains, instead of it being like more scattered and even throughout the season, it's coming in 
huge amounts and then nothing and then huge amounts and then nothing. So I've had to upgrade my system to be able to handle, yeah, that. handle that. Yeah. And then I got some gray water stuff going on. We'll talk about more on that later. And then some condensation. I've got that. Those are like, I got four sources of uh, water, not including taking myself out and watering the trees. Oh, there you fertilizing, go. Fertilizing the trees. Yeah, there yes. you go. There you go. Well, and gray water isn't actually a source of water. It's a reuse of water. And I'm, and I'm, I'm actually glad you said that because in permaculture, we have two opposing, but when I say opposing, that's not a bad thing, concepts. One's alternate? called stacking. What's that? Alternate, two alternate concepts. Two alternate. Okay, good. That might work. Stacking functions is one of them. So that's having an asset like a chicken that does multiple things for you in your yard. Or like in the past here at the Urban Farm, I've used the condensation and the overflow water from the evaporative cooler to go into a fish pond where I raised fish, and then the fish pooped in the water, and that went to water the gardens. So that's using, an, that's stacking functions. It uses that water three times before, you know, before you ultimately let it go so that's one of them the other side of that is making sure that you have more than one source of water what's that called don that's uh that's creating a, a sustainable model we can't rely on one source yep. of the most important element in uh -huh. the design right no matter where you are is that resilient design I What's, would call that resilient, re yeah. regenerative. Yes, absolutely. Yes. There's a term he's looking for. What term are you looking for? Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's the problem. I'm not coming up with it. It's one of the <laughs> concepts. It's one of the concepts in permaculture, and it's uh, um, many. Yeah, I can't remember. It's all good. It's all good. So many, many elements in the design supporting one part of the guild or one part of the thing thank you exactly and that element has multiple functions yep. to support it yeah there you go it's, it's a mollison thing right <laughs> exactly so that's how many sources of water we have so let's talk about you you mentioned gray water gray water is a reuse of water so what's that look like on your property at boasis don well, I see it as an advantage because, you know, normally it would just go straight down the sink or straight down the bath tub hole or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. I see it as like, okay, well, this is, this is water. It still has value. Might have a bit of soap in it, but that, but that's okay. It can go out to the hungry plants, uh, you know, in the, in the landscape. And it's important, you know, especially if you have tropicals or or exotics, they need a lot more water than the uh, arid adapted plants in mm -hmm. the landscape. So yeah, anytime you got a fruit bearing tree in the, in a arid climate, they, they need all the water they can get. Yeah, exactly. I said, and you not, you need to not waste the water that you are giving to them. Right. So right. give them all the water they can and then don't let it evaporate into the air. Yeah. We'll talk right. about that in a minute. And mm -hmm. so there's really two ways to, utilize gray water because so gray water is any water that goes down any sink of your house except the kitchen sink which they call black water in a lot of states and toilets and in a lot of right. states it's legal to use gray water and yes. you can either replumb your house to get the water out of the house or and that's always easiest to do when you're building or you can move your facilities outside so what have you done about that don uh, I did move my facilities outside. I moved my shower outside. In, in, the, in the Phoenix area out here, I can shower outside in tepid water straight from the tap right. uh, from June until, you know, into October. So I move me outside. I, I relocate <laughs> myself. And so, I, so the gray water that is coming off of the shower is right under the tree, which needs the water. And so to me, it's a perfect relationship, beneficial relationship to, for me to move outside during yeah. the summertime. Excellent. In some areas of Phoenix, like the north area where I live, in the summertime, our tepid water almost needs ice to cool down. So <laughs> <laughs> right. we, don't, we don't have cold showers in the summertime. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. What I've done here at the Urban Farm is I replumbed one of my bathrooms 
so that the water flows out of the house. But then I also put in an outdoor shower and an outdoor sink to rinse vegetables in our hands and that kind of stuff. So that's that's gray water. Rainwater, yes. on the other hand, yes. uh, and I get this question a lot. And here in the desert, people ask me, well, why bother? We don't get enough rain. And interestingly enough, I've had that question from people in places that they get a lot of water. And they say, well, why bother? We get so much rain. So why bother, Don? Why bother? Because even though some places get a lot of rain, it's still seasonal. So there's, oh, yeah. always, there's always the gap, the dry spell, the dry period. You know, even in England, where I come from, they're getting dry spells. They are now lasting, you know, one or two months, you know, and that can, plants can die in that period of time with the sun still blazing and the wind still blowing and all the rest of it. So, yeah, even when I grew up in England, we had, um, we had water sh- limits. Oh, uh, interesting, I, I lived really? in a 20 housing complex. And we had one standpipe, you know, one tap that was put by the city council, screwed into the meter out by the front of the property of the community. Uh And everyone had to go out with buckets and fill their buckets and walk it back into the house. What? So even even in England, wettest, greenest England, there's water shortages from time to time. And so that's why you need above ground storage tanks to fill up during the rainy time Mm -hmm. and then keep that as backup for when you have your dry spells. You know, I bet there's a lot of people in the Pacific Northwest right now that are wishing that they had some water storage (laughs) going. Duh! Why didn't I save some water, right? right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So... I found that principle. What principle? That principle of Bill Mollison. All right. Give it to us. Go for it. Each important function is supported by many elements. Yes, that one. And each element is supported by many functions. Yeah. Well, each element yeah, that's support, the, performs many functions. That's performs the, many functions. Right. That's the opposing piece that I was speaking to. <laughs> it's right. kind of the yin the, yang. The opposite. Yeah, yin and yang. That's good. It's the difference, you know, the other yeah. side of the coin. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, and so those are some of the ways that we can get water. Don't forget condensation from your air conditioning unit. You'd be surprised right. if you have air conditioning how much water actually comes off. But one of the things that we've mm. been seeing a lot of this year, Don, is wind. Do you remember a time yeah. when we've had so much wind? Oh, it seems to be progressing more and more for yeah. the last 10 years. I mean, yeah. the, the climate here has significantly changed in the last 10 years. Right. And, uh, yeah, we're getting a lot more wind for a longer period of time. The dry spell is lengthening out longer and longer. And that, that because that's happening, the trees are suffering. And the trees are the, are the water pumps that mm. bring water mm-hmm. from the soil up through the system and then disperse it into the atmosphere keeping it cool, propagating the clouds, the thunder clouds that will bring more rain. It's a, it's a cycle thing. One, one needs the other to happen. It's, everything has to work together. And that's, there's a breakdown right now between the available water in the soil to create the evaporation, to create the clouds, and the mm-hmm. clouds to create the rain and bring the water back, cycle it back. So with our, with our heat continuously rising, that's the global warming part, Right. affects the, and is creating the, the climate crisis. So those two are connected, but they're slightly different in their emphasis. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot more dead trees, as we mentioned earlier. You know, they're just things are dehydrating. And so what can we do yeah. to address that, Don? Deep, deeper watering. When we irrigate, we should deep water mm-hmm. and then... That water should then also be have a blanket over it. We we call it mulch, right? Right, a nice, a nice thick mat of mulch material around the root zone, uh, and that will assist the tree or plant, shrub, whatever it is, vegetable, whatever it is you want to try and keep to hold on to and maintain moisture around the root zone, so that they're vegetative head of the plant mm-hmm. is not suffering and wilting, you know, worsting. And if wilted plant in the morning, that's a that's an observation danger side. Right. Because that plant may not make it through the afternoon if it's already wilted in the morning. Yeah. 
When so the basins around fruit trees, I call my six six rule in my fruit yes. tree education. For those of you that aren't in Phoenix, I run a I'm 22 years into running a fruit tree education program, teaching people how to be successful with fruit trees. And uh, as Don mentioned earlier, he he'd like to become a student of one of the people in the chat room and learn from her. I actually right. signed up for a fruit tree education program through Susan up at Orchard People. And most of it's pretty basic so far, but I signed up on purpose because she's in Toronto. And th- so they get extreme weather on the other end in the winter. And so I'm looking for patterns. I'm looking for ideas on how do we keep plants and trees alive in extreme cases. And so we yeah. get more of that. It's yeah, which hotter, getting... drier, yeah. wetter, windier. Well, not you wetter know, here. But... Happening well uh, it, in general. Yeah. You know, yeah. and one thing that's important: it doesn't matter if you're in the dry desert or the very wet, humid zones. Your trees need to have deep roots, and those roots need to have good soil around them. Because if you're going to be having super dry zones then they need to be able to be down low where they're cool and they can get the moisture that's down deep in the soil. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the really wet zones, then they need to have the nice strong roots to go down so that they can find the air pockets. But if you're getting the really heavy rains, you need those trees need to have the nice strong deep roots to hang on. Otherwise they can get washed away. I mean, any element of harsh weather that you throw at a tree the deeper roots that tree has, the longer it's going to be able to survive. Yeah. You know? Amen to that. So what I just took out of that was lots of mulch. Yeah. Deep watering when we deep water so that the roots go deep. And so when it does get hot, those roots can reach down and harvest the water yes. they need. And basins to the drip line. Oh, yes. And what the, is the, the drip the, line? The, the, well, you have a nice canopy of the tree. And then that portion of which where the foliage creates the umbrella effect, it's that drip line off of the umbrella that you, that, oh. that line you have to catch in your basin. That was a really good definition, Don. Thank you very much. Yeah. I was a little worried about how his hands were going, but yes. <laughs> well, I got to get the brolly out, right? Right, yeah. The, exactly. I'm sorry, the brolly? Yeah, I, I used umbrella because we're speaking globally here, but in England it's the brolly. The brawly. Oh, yes. interesting. Yes. Brawly. Yes. I don't think I've opened a brawly in a very long time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, only I, for the sun, right? Last week it actually rained here for the day, which was really odd for a summertime rain. It was well, just your sp- side of town wasn't my side of town. Yeah, all right, it was a sprinkle all day, and I took That's the dog right. for a walk with no brawly. Ah. No problem. So when we have these summer monsoon rain events, literally, the, my side of the street can be bone dry, and I can look across 50 yards away at the other side of the street, yep. and it can be raining cats and dogs, and I'm standing there going, what? What's happening? <laughs> right. So uh, let's talk about different kinds of irrigation methods. You mentioned right. Oyas before we got started. Don, you want to touch on those? Well, this is ancient technology. Mm-hmm. So we're going way back. Low ancient technologies coming out of uh, the Middle East primarily. So imagine a, a round bottom vase, kind of, that mm-hmm. is unglazed. And so it, it, water can travel back and forth. So it's an unglazed jar with a a flared top so you can put a cap on it and then you know manually you can take a watering can or hose and fill up each of the jugs that's within your planter put the lid back on to to stop the evaporation and Mm -hmm. then that water wicks through into Uh, the root zone of the bed that you have gotta love that that's that's the basic Oyas. I'm sure yeah. there's better definitions, but uh, yeah. what did, da- did David say any more about that, or is that oh, basically yeah. it? David's got a whole lecture on Oyas, as did Sarah from the last Water Harvesting Summit. So right. That's a, a very effective way. In fact, Sarah's got one that has drip irrigation into it. 
Right. So whenever you turn on your drip irrigation, the oya fills up, and then uh, oh, right. it percolates through the porous pot for days, and then it fills up again. The way it has, it's got a reservoir created, and it chain-linked oyas. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Cool. cool. And, and then you also mentioned wicking beds. What on earth is a wicking bed? All right. We're going back to elementary uh, science now. So we use the, the evaporation effect. So just like the Oya is a reservoir mm -hmm. in, a, in a small, compact manner, we can go much bigger in a, in a bed. Let's, let's go with the standard four foot by eight foot, slightly raised bed. Why do you That's only go four typical. feet wide? Why do you only go four feet wide? Well, because you can reach across. You, you, you don't mess up your back. You, yep. you can reach across the bed, and it's a lot easier to, to maintain. And it's, you know, you can sit on a stool, and you can work the bed without harming yourself. So it's good. So you can raise the bed as high as you want. You can put it at wheelchair level. Uh, that, does, that part doesn't matter. So... Ideally, you want about 18 inches of a raised bed because the, the lower half of that measurement, the, the lower 50%, that's going to be the reservoir. So the, the bed itself is going to be lined with like a fish pond liner or some other kind of mm -hmm. impervious plastic liner so that the water stays in the bed. Then you want uh, some kind of a filler. So in a corner of the bed, you put maybe a two inch or three inch PVC pipe, bring it down and you bring it horizontally across the bed with weep holes in it. So as you put your hose in the vertical section of it, that's in the corner, then you fill the reservoir of the lower half of the raised bed. Then you put a, uh, a landscape fabric to separate the reservoir area, which is basically for the rock, from the potting soil, soil or mm -hmm. garden soil in the top of the bed. Now, the wicking action is literally the sun's action with, with water, is the trans-evaporation, the, the evaporation rate coming through the, the bed from the reservoir, through the soil, and then dispersed out into the atmosphere. So... Even in the Phoenix area, we can load up that reservoir once or twice a week for all the plants that are in that bed. And then in the winter, it can be once a month. And for us in this arid, dry climate, that's a blessing, not having right. to go out every morning to water right. your plants. So having a wicking bed lengthens the time. I mean, you can go away for the weekend or even the week. And you know your bed is going to be watered and taken care of. It's a lot less stress uh, worrying about does the, my vegetables or whatever my food is growing, does it have enough water? You just fill up the reservoir before you leave and then you're good to go. Nice. So both of these, the Oyas and the wicking beds, are waters traveling to the plants, essentially, the plant yes. roots. Yes. Now, the Oya is being affected by the by the pull of the roots. Mm -hmm. So the roots grow around that vase and it's there ready to receive it right away. It's taking it up. So water molecules follow each other in a chain. So as the water molecules are exiting the root, that is then brought up by the plants that's around it. Yeah. And water seeks a balance. So yes. if there's a dry area in a wet pot, the water, and it has the ability to pass through it, the water is gonna leave the wet pot up yes. to its maximum capacity in the soil around it. And yes. the soil is going to uptake that. That's called osmosis. Yes. So, yes, from wet to dry, there's always a need to balance across the membrane, whatever yeah. that membrane is. And the, the oya pot has that, it acts like a membrane. So it's an osmotic factor. Yeah. Awesome. Science. Yeah, you gotta yes. love science. science. Permaculture rocks, man. It's Ooh. steam all the way. <laughs> and if you're interested in wicking beds, We'll uh, put up some links there on urbanfarm.org. We've got some articles there on wicking beds. Cool. Excellent. And um, yeah, I have some wicking pots at my place. So oh, I do like nice. them. I've built wicking beds for school gardens. You know, taking the stress of going out every day in a school garden, 
you build a wicking bed, you're out there once a week, you can fill up the reservoir, and then the teacher doesn't have to think about it again, and they can go out for the following Monday mm -hmm. and do their class, you know, once a week class. So, yeah, these factors playing, especially, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with energy use. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So that's two ways to water your garden, and then there's my favorite way. This is, a, uh, this is a, 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 the other side of the coin. This is called right. drip tape. Drip tape is an amazing revolutionary product. Generally, it's just used in large farms. And so it's hard to find drip tape supplies for the garden level. So if you, you, know, if you go to the store on our website, uh, we've got drip tape supplies for you. But the cool thing about drip tape is that it's like drip irrigation, so conceptually, it's like drip irrigation. But the big difference between drip tape and drip irrigation is, is that you can get more water at the beginning of a drip irrigation system and less at the end. So the water isn't distributed evenly. With drip tape, it's distributed evenly throughout your system. And uh, what, That would be pressure compensating. Very good. <laughs> Perfect. And what happens with drip tape is that the entire system has to pressurize before any of the tape starts leaking. And the tape, it's just this lay flat. It's about a, maybe a little over a half inch wide. That it, And it, when it turns on, it fills up. And about every six or eight inches, there's a laser cut slit in it. And when it, like I said, when it fully is pressurized through the entire system, then it starts leaking. The other cool thing about drip tape is we have a lot of salts in our water here at the, in the desert. That gets washed out. The way that the drip tape system is set up, it gets washed out. So we're not getting, you know, with, with drip irrigation, you can get clogged emitters and that kind of stuff. And the emitters change. You know, I have to, I have some drip irrigation on my back patio. And I, I notice over time that it changes and I have to change the system in order to make it work. You know, one nice thing about the drip tape is that because it plays it out evenly across the whole tape, the pressure is consistent across the whole tape, so it's going to be dripping at the same rate. Mm -hmm. If you have a small bed, you don't need to water it as long to get the water. But like I did that in this picture back here is my orchard, and I've got a dozen, more than a dozen trees on a big uh, elevated section, and I put drip tape on that. But because I have such a massive area covered by drip tape, I just let the drip tape run longer to get what I want. And it'll go the same, but it's still evenly applied across the whole section. Yeah. So you let it run cool. for, on trees. You let it run more, less often, right? Correct. Yes. Deep watering. Yes. Yeah. I do the deep watering. That, like we talked about which earlier. Is, which is good for my particular soil content because I have a lot of clay and water goes through slower it gives me that deep, consistent watering and a healthy level for my trees yeah. over the whole area. So I don't have little spots of good watering. I have a whole blanket of good watering. But because I transferred this garden concept to a tree concept, to an orchard, instead of running it for half an hour, I have this big space. I run it for several hours, but I feel good about what I've got on those trees. And my trees feel good too. Nice. All right. So... Three takeaways, Don, and then you're next, Janice. Well, actually, I would like to snag some of that uh, drip tape. I got one area that's uh, about an eight foot by 10 foot vegetable yep. bed that I have inline drips now, but they're not working. It's, it's not equal to the bed that's out front. It's on the same right. kind of system. So I'm thinking... Maybe I'll give the tape a try in that one bed yeah. and see if I can equalize some of my some of my issues, some of my systems, and then that will give me another form of of uh, irrigation that I can model at my at my home site for right. my classes. Yeah, exactly. All right, good. So one takeaway for you is drip tape. Yeah, yeah. I want to go with that. See what happens. All right, Janice, takeaway. My takeaway is there's multiple possibilities. You can customize based on what your system needs. You can do drip tape, you can do oils, you can do flood irrigation, you can do wicking beds. We didn't talk about cisterns, but we can do cisterns. 
There's so many different options that will be perfect for you. One of them will. Yeah, right. And that's, uh, that's where the observation comes in. That's, that's my takeaway. That's where the observation comes in. You have to pay attention to what's going on in your space for a protracted period of time so that you can get to a place where you do what's best for your space. And be prepared to change your plans. Oh, yeah. And there and you that. go. <laughs> and be prepared to change your mind. All right. Well, thank you both very much for joining us today on our June 2021 Garden Chat. I know it's Water in and and for your landscape. Yep. Cool, cool. Well, thank you, Don. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Don. It's so it's great to listen to you. I love your scientific mind and how you put things into into clarity for me. Excellent. Yeah, uh, that's taken a lot of practice and a lot of uh, classes to to define and clarify in my own head. So my mouth is is speaking what my mind is trying to say. <laughs> nice. I think that's just age. Oh, don't hey, go hey, there. Hey, 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 don't go there. <laughs> All right, so Janice, who do we have on for next month? Oh, my goodness. Next month is going to be fun. Our garden chats, we have topics um, continuing. Next month, we're going to have Nikki Chabor talking oh. about small space, big potential. Nice, and she's a... Uh... She's a great author as well. Now, this podcast is going to be released on the same week that Nikki's going to talk. So if you happen to catch this podcast, sign in that night for the for the garden chat. And if you're going to be uh, looking forward, we've got um, in August for live, we have Kari Spencer talking about some permaculture concepts. Nice. Nice, nice. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us evening and this evening, and we'll uh, we'll catch you on the flip side. Have a great one. Bye, guys. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.